Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this week's Let's Talk Dairy. So today I'm joined by Siobhan Kavna, who's a Design Post Communication Specialist. And we're, today we're going to talk about the Board Beer Report and knowing your carbon footprint. So I am Siobhan is working from home, obviously, at the moment because of COVID and so forth, and her signal isn't great. So I'm going to share um, her presentation. And so bear with us if there's a bit of stumbling along, kind of trying to to change over so uh, we'd encourage people to ask questions because this is an area that people have had access to this with a good number of years really but i suppose there hasn't been a huge emphasis put on it from our own side even and maybe from your side as well and a key element of this is putting in good data i suppose Siobhan, as well isn't it like that the, the sustainability report is a key part of this and on a, in a lot of cases they're probably um taking place in a bit of an ad hoc uh, fashion maybe kind of the night before this the uh, audit is taking place or maybe in conjunction with the auditor kind of give me a rough idea kind of scenario and they can be very far off the mark because you have been asked questions that maybe the answers are nine ten months ago maybe even yes. further possibly and you're given the wrong answer and that's influencing what your figure is going to be so you're going to talk to us about knowing the number and you have also some a case study and you also have some direction that the future is going to take in relation to this report which will simplify that uh, data gathering piece of it. Now we've simplified it quite a lot, I suppose, even in the last number of years as well. So ICBF are feeding in all the stock figures, etc. But we're hoping that we'll be able to automate a lot of it so that there won't be as much pressure on the, the um, person that's having the audit to come up with the answers and that we get more accurate data as a result of that. So I'll hand over to you and as I said, I encourage people to put in questions as we go along. And I'll uh, ask you some questions as we're going along if we think if I think we need any clarity on any points as well. So thanks for coming on this morning as well. All right. Thanks very much, Stuart. Good morning, everybody. And as Stuart said, my my reception isn't the best here at home, but hopefully it'll it'll hold up for the next half an hour or so. The title of my presentation is Know Your Number, and that's to know your carbon footprint, the carbon footprint figure for your farm. As we know, we have to reduce our total emissions by between 22 and 30 percent over the next 10 years. And a really important starting point is to know what the baseline for your own farm is. So what is the emissions on your own farm at the moment so that you can put a plan in place to reduce those emissions? It's also useful to know this number to, to track your progress over the next couple of years, but also to benchmark yourself on other farms. Like in everything else we do on farm, we're, we're, we're using the data to help us to make decisions and reducing your carbon footprint is no different. It's starting off with knowing the information for your farm. And there is useful information in the farmer feedback reports, which I'll show you in a few minutes, um, that will help you to put a plan in place to reduce emissions on your farm. Next one, Stuart. So what is the car carbon footprint? And the carbon footprint refers to how much greenhouse gases are emit emitted from an activity, such as producing milk, meat, um, a ton of grain or driving a car or taking a flight. So it's whatever emissions, but that's greenhouse gas emissions. So that's carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide are produced in, in doing any of those different activities. So every activity has a carbon footprint associated with it. And we're concentrating in obviously here on the agricultural ones today. So in, the, in farming, the production of every kilo of meat and milk or grain has a carbon footprint, and that accounts for all the associated activities. So in producing milk, it accounts for the emissions from the animal, which is primarily methane, the emissions from manure, the emissions from or, or the emissions associated with the production of, of feed um, and in particular concentrates, um, but also the protein within that concentrate as well, because that is a source of, of nitrous oxide. And the chemical fertilizer, the emissions associated with, with spreading it, but also the emissions associated with producing it. And obviously the end of the emissions from the energy, energy use on the farm. So it, it's accounting for everything associated with the production of the kilo of milk up to the, to the farm gate point and not beyond that. It doesn't account for the processing of it. The units that we use to, to measure this, and you'll become familiar with, with seeing this num or this, this unit um, over the next short while, is, is kilos of CO2 equivalent per kilo of fat and protein corrected milk. Now, it's a bit of a mouthful. So we're saying that for every kilo of milk, there's um, so much um, carbon emissions um, in, uh, in units of kilos of CO2 equivalent per kg of fat and protein corrected milk. It's on a basis of fat and protein 
corrected make to bring them all back to a level playing field. Okay, because obviously there's a good deal of variation in fat and protein content. So bringing them back to that corrected milk makes it easier for comparison purposes. And the CO2E, which is equivalent, basically accounts for carbon dioxide, methane, and the nitrous oxide, not, not ammonia. Ammonia is not a greenhouse gas, but the E basically pulls all of them three, the other three together. So carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. So that's the carbon footprint. To move on to the next slide. So Siobhan, just before we do move on there, will you just uh, go into a little bit more detail around the protein piece there that just, you mentioned, just to clarify what, why, why, does, why does protein have an influence on it? Yeah, so if, if, if you're feeding, you're feeding a protein, you're, say animals need 16% protein in their total diet. Well, if you're feeding a diet that has 20% protein in the total diet, there's excess protein beyond what the animal needs to produce milk or meat or whatever it is. Um, and that excess protein is excreted. And there's a proportion of that um, excreted as, as your, in urine and feces, primarily in urine. Um, and that ends up as nitrous oxide, being emitted as nitrous oxide. So excess protein in diets. That's why we're encouraging farmers to reduce their protein. That's why in derogation at the moment, um, there's a requirement over the summer period to drop protein levels, I think, to 14%. It's to try and reduce that level of excess protein that is a certain proportion of it is ending up in the atmosphere. It's primarily associated with ammonia losses, but that can also be associated with greenhouse gas losses as well. Okay, very good. Okay, so where do you get your carbon footprint? All, far all farmers are in the sustainability, um, the ESDAS scheme, so the Sustainable Dairy Assurance Scheme. And every 18 months, as you know, you get it, there's an audit. Um, and at the end of that audit, farmers re re receive a farmer feedback report. That farmer feedback report now will provide farmers with details on their carbon footprint, um, where, the, where the emissions are coming from on the farm, and then some guidance on some of the actions they can take to reduce the carbon footprint. OK, so now what I want to do is just go in and explain what information is used to generate that carbon footprint in the report and to highlight maybe some of the areas and particularly as Stuart said in the, earlier on is the round of sustainability survey and what you, you need to input into it and the importance of the accuracy of that information. So this is just a model of the system and, and I want to acknowledge Port Bia, this is their, their flow chart. So there's four key sources of information that are needed to provide us with a carbon footprint. So there's the AIM, so the Animal Identification and Movement System, and that basically gives us our stock numbers right throughout the year. So that comes from the Department of Agriculture. The second source of information is the sustainability survey. And this is the survey that you complete when you're doing that audit. I think they asked that that be, that be completed in advance of it. It's, they're trying to encourage more and more people to do that online. It can be done on paper, but they are encouraging more and more to do it online. And I'll come back and talk about that a bit more because that, that is very, very important in terms of getting accurate information. The milk data comes from the co-op, so that gives us um, an account of the, the milk production data on, on, on the, the farm. And then on the beef side, ICBF is providing information on, on um, live, weight, uh, live weights and live weight gains, um, and also slaughter ages, which is um, for, for the beef enterprises important. So all that information is feeding into the board BIA system, okay? And the model that's used then to calculate the carbon footprint is the Chagas carbon footprint model. So Chagas have developed a model called the LCA model. You may have heard of this. It's the, the life cycle assessment model. And basically that model accounts for everything that's associated with the production of a kilo, a kilo of milk. And the information that's provided from these four sources will give us that information for the model to generate a carbon footprint figure. So this is an internationally recognized model. Um, that's been developed over a number of years by Chagas. Like you're, you're going back, I know there's, there's a lot of talk about carbon emissions right now, but the research associated with this has gone back, uh, the initial research has gone back 10 or 15 years. And that model is constantly being updated. And I'll come back and talk about that at the end of the developments that are happening in relation to that right now. So that, that model is used to generate then the carbon footprint. So the inputs go into the carbon footprint model the carbon footprint model calculates the, the carbon, carbon footprint and also calculates the breakdown of where, the, what's the breakdown of that footprint, what proportion of it is coming from the animal, what proportion is coming from manures, from chemical fertilizers, from feed, feed, and, feed and fertilizer, from energy. That's given the carbon footprint that feeds back into the, the board BIA system that gives you the output in terms of your, your, your farmer feedback report um, every 18 months or so. Okay. 
So that's a, just a very quick overview, but the main sources of, of information come from the department, your, your own information, which is key, the information from the co-op in terms of the milk data and ICBF then on, on live weights and, and slaughter ages, which is important from, from a, a beef production point of view. And I suppose, Siobhan, like just to highlight that piece in the sustainability survey, like we've actually obviously been involved with some of my monitor farm programs that I'm involved with. We've seen where maybe people haven't thought through their sustainability yeah. survey piece enough. And yeah. then they get the report back and they're a bit shocked that their figure is what it is and they go out digging into it a little bit. Next thing they find that the figures that they presented maybe aren't exactly correct. And when we get them tweaked, then they find that their, their figures improve. But if people if people don't pay attention to the report either, maybe like when they get it back, they, they might have a false false figure that they're working with. So it's, it is important to look at it when they get back. Yeah. And also to... Um, to think about the survey before you do it is it's yeah. an important piece of the jigsaw like because it, you have to bear in mind as a, as a milk supplier across the country that the data that's been presented by your co-op on, on the carbon footprint of your your uh, catch, milk catchment area is actually taken from this information so Absolutely. it's important that information is accurate like yeah yeah and I, I, the next slide will deal with the sustainability survey but it's an important point that when you get back that farmer feedback report if you're looking at it and going this just doesn't make sense the figures that are on it like you have the option to ring the helpline now i don't have the details up here but we can we can email them around maybe later on and um, you can ring the helpline and say look i'm not happy with the figures that are in there you can get that adjusted um, like we'd like to reach a situation where you could go in and adjust it yourself, um, but that's down the line. But that helpline is is there, and they they're trained to help you to go through it if needs be. So the, the first thing, and I'll talk about it again later on, is is to check exactly what's there on that page to, to ensure that the, the figures are accurate, because otherwise the the data that you're you're relying on is 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 not appropriate. So the sustainability survey, this is completed as, far, as part of your farm audit. And um, as I say, that can be done online now. You can just still do the physical copy, but I think they're trying to encourage more and more people to do this online. So the key pieces of information that are needed in that sustainability survey are your grazing days, details on feed, fertilizer, and manure. And the more accurately, as Stuart said, that you put in that information, the more accurate your carbon footprint figure is, is going to be. Particularly now, it's when you're, you're at your baseline. So we're saying 2021 is a baseline or whenever you have your next one. Um, it, it's important that you, you start at that right baseline because if you, if you don't do it right, if, if it's not right for this first one, and then the next one you do do it right, you can either look like you've, you've improved more than you actually have, or you've disimproved more than you probably have. So it's important to get that first baseline one correct. And maybe it's, it's a point that you'd go back and even and correct in the most recent one that you've already got done. So the four pieces of information um, are the grazing days, feed, fertilizer, and manure. And very often you're doing that. If you get an audit today, it's for 2020 data. So you could be looking back, as Stuart said, even beyond 10 or 11 months, you could be 12, 12, 12 months um, back that you could be looking for data. So keeping accurate data in each of these areas will make it an awful lot easier when you come to fill that survey that you have the information to do that. So how does that feed into then how we actually calculate the emissions or calculate your, your, your footprint? So grazing days, so the, the days at days of grass, it helps the, the model to calculate the manure storage that's needed. So obviously your grazing days, the, the reverse of that is the days that animals are housed and, and the slurry that's produced. So it gives you your, your manure storage and that does an emissions associated with that. Um, it'll give you the manure and, and, and urine that's, um, emit, that's at grass and the emissions associated with that. And it also gives you the length of the grazing season uh, for the, the, the grass fed status. And I suppose, Siobhan, just in the back of that then, <clears throat> like we we've spoken about it recently, it was actually mentioned at the dairy conference by Mick last week as well, that we'll say grazing the better covers are helping to reduce uh, methane emissions by up to 14%, I think, from some of the work that Carl Wims has done. But that's um, that's been driven by just lower levels of um, just the way the rumen works, basically, digesting silage versus digesting grass, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And and we'll see this when we come on to look at the report. Um, if if from the animal, like if, if you look at the breakdown of the emissions, methane, it's methane that's associated with the animal. So if they're based grazing better quality cover, grass, so if they're grazing 1400 covers versus 2000 covers, well, then the methane emissions are going to be lower on those lower covers. So every week extra grass, regardless of how many weeks you're already at grass, gives you that benefit. It's less silage in the diet. It's less slurry storage. 
it's less 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 slurry to be to be um, to be um, to be spread, and also it's less methane in terms of the rumen and how the rumen breaks down that that forage. So basically, any forage that has high high fiber levels, so um, grass grass silage versus grass, it's going to have higher methane emissions than grazed grass. So yeah, Mick is right. Every day, every week at extra grass gives an improvement in in your carbon footprint and your reduction in in, in total emissions. Okay, so on the feed one then, that feeds into um, animal digestion as well then. So if we know that there's a bigger proportion of the diet, so if animals are, are housed for six months of the, sorry, my presentation's gone. Sorry. If animals are housed for six months of the, the, the year, well, obviously their emissions are going to be higher because the methane emissions are going to be higher from them. And you also have extra, the, the extra slurry, slurry storage and, and spreading as well. Um, the the it calculates that the the if it, you you put, must put in your milk replacer because the important point here is it does take into account where feed is produced, um the production of feed but also the the utilization of it. So concentrates coming in say from um the concentrate feeds isn't as detailed maybe as it should be and that's probably something they're going to try and look at. So you put in your concentrate feeds it doesn't specify what proportion of that is is homegrown versus imported, but it does specify, I think, the soya content because soya coming in from South America, the um, land use change, there's major emissions associated with that. So the production of feed is accounted for in the LCA model. And likewise on fertilizer production, that's likewise associated, that's also um, accounted for in the LCA model. So under the fertilizer then, so the fertilizer production is accounted for the fertilizer application. Um, the fertilizer types now are also included in it. They weren't up until, until recently. So protected jury is accounted for differently um, to, relative to can. Lime is accounted for. Lime in the first year you spread it is an emitter of, of greenhouse gases. In the longer term, it's positive, and we would be encouraging farmers to lime to try and reduce their the nitrogen requirement. But in year one, and I don't understand the science of it, but it, it is an emitter of, of greenhouse gases. So that's why that's included there. And the manure one then, so the application time, and, and we ask for in, in the board B a survey, survey, they look for when the when it's actually applied because um, there is variation. Obviously, the, the, the earlier in the year, the better. The application method, we are encouraging more and more farmers to, to go towards LESS, and we saw from our um, um, sustainability report this week that has improved significantly. So how it's applied will be accounted for in the model, and then the, st the storage likewise. The information that's coming from this comes in directly to, to Borbia under the aims and, and that will give the animal inventory. So that will give a breakdown then of the animal types, the breed, sex, um, and the, then that, that then gives us the, the digestion and the potential methane emissions from that. So as I said earlier on, if you have an audit this year and as you know yourself, you're looking at data for last year, it is really important that you can keep um, reasonable records because it's very hard to go that far back to try and remember a turnout dates and how, when you put out the slurry and that type of thing. You have a broad outline, but the more accurate you can put that information in, the more accurate your carbon footprint is going to be coming back. Okay, we can move okay, on. Siobhan, to I'm not sure if you can answer this question because I'm not sure of it myself now, but there's a question okay. in there in relation to can we see the the or the most three or this the sustainability report data that we've submitted most recently or when when it's when you're finished i'm not actually sure if you can i don't think you can so if you want to look at it maybe just to review it before before it's yeah i will i'd say if you want to look at it before you go to do your new audit we'll say you you'd have to you could print off what your most recent audit was off the online um portal i'd say or maybe uh, someone in the co-op would be able to get it for you or whatever but I'd say the, the question is kind of more like if you want to review like we were suggesting people to get it corrected can you actually see it but I'm not really sure I, I, I don't think you can see it yourself but you can yeah. you can ring that helpline um, and ask them to go through it and maybe they'd be able to bring it up on 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 they can bring it up on screen but I don't think you can go in and view it yourself no yeah my thinking is that that gets locked once your report is um, created basically so I know from uh, one or two of the co-ops that I'm dealing with now that uh, there's people in the co-op that I contact about those reports. I, I didn't realise the helpline was there for Borbia directly, but the, those people are responsible for the carbon footprint within the co-op and that they're 
they're looking following up on those queries that are coming in from people so yeah and there's just one other point made there by one of the people on this morning is that the sustainability survey if it's echoing what we've been saying yeah should be, shouldn't be done on the day of the audit it should no. be a requirement that it's completed beforehand because well i think i think it is a requirement actually um i know board b have told us that it is a requirement that it's completed because i think the auditors were finding it was taking a long time to try and do this sustainability survey on the day of the audit so i think they were trying to encourage more and more to do them in advance online it would make more sense anyway because at least you'd have time to maybe look up a, um, a bit of data and look up some of your records but i think there is a rep they are encouraging farmers to do it in advance yeah definitely and uh, i suppose that's the key, the key point is that the look the i think the auditors will spend the time doing the survey but they won't probably give you time to go looking up figures Absolutely. so, so you're going to give them the first thing that comes into your mind yeah. and that's not going to be right probably so while I, it's not an actual, they, they want it done beforehand, it's not a deal breaker. They're not going to not come and do your audit like if you haven't it done. So they're going to they're going to flick through it. And that's often a lot of the causes of the, yeah. the mis, uh, miscalculations and the inaccurate data that's going in is because people aren't uh, um, sure they, what they're telling yeah. them. And they don't have time to be spending a lot of yeah. time. They'll do it with you, absolutely. But they're not going to have to have the time to spend. And it, just to stress, that point again the accuracy of the information here is so key to you having an accurate um accurate report at the end of the day like we did walks there in the autumn and we would have had to go back and get some of them checked to make sure particularly around fertilizer and i think you've seen yeah. that well Stuart, yourself yeah. around fertilizers the figures sometimes aren't that accurate and it can really throw you off um it can be excessively high or excessively low and then it's it's hard to track your progress then if you're not consistent with it every time you do this audit because you have the you have the opportunity to track your progress with this, which is great it's a big plus with it but the information needs to be accurate every year and um, to be able to do that okay very yeah. good they going yeah okay so this is this is um excerpts from the report so on page one of the report you get the top the top line there which basically gives you your carbon footprint and um, the dairy carbon footprint and um, it's not the whole farm carbon footprint it's it's for the dairy only so if you have beef animals they're separate if you've got uh, our replacements are separate. This is specifically for the dairy herd. Um, the units, as I said earlier on, are kgs of CO2. Um, it should be equivalent, but they don't actually write that, write that in the report, per kg of fat and protein corrected milk. So for this example, this farmer has a carbon footprint of 0.99, okay? And the national average is 0.99. This is actually 0.98 in there, but it's actually 0.99. So this this, this farmer's um, carbon footprint is 0.9. So for every, every kilo of fat and protein corrected milk this farmer is producing, his or her uh, footprint is 0.99 kilos of carbon dioxide. As I said earlier on, it's not just carbon dioxide. That accounts for everything in, in terms of greenhouse gases. So your CO2, your methane, and your nitrous oxide accounts for them all. The second line that it gives you is the change from the previous audit. OK, so it's saying here that this farmer's carbon footprint has decreased by 16 percent relative to the last audit, possibly 18 months ago. That's a fairly significant drop. And I would and I don't know what way you'd view it, Stuart, but I would kind of question that a little bit and go, well, was the, was the carbon footprint correct the last time around? Is it right this time around? It is possible that it dropped that, that much, but it's just something to check the figures on your feedback reports to make sure that they're right, to make sure that this figure is accurate. Uh, relative to where you were previously. Do you want to comment on that, Stuart? Because I know you've come across this. Yeah, I'd agree with you. If it looks uh, quite significant, you, um, depending on the farm, uh, I would say there are some of the farms now that we've been dealing with have implemented a lot of the changes yeah. in the last 12 or 18 months and their gains will be true from that point of view. So a lot of protected urea, maybe a lot of clover brought onto the farm, significant reduction in fertilizer use in a very short space of time. Um, and increases then as herbs have matured as well. So their output is diluting their carbon yeah. to a certain extent as well, which you're going to show later on. So yeah, yeah, I would say that that's that's true. So like if it, but um, I think people have been a bit taken aback as well by some the way the figures have gone. They've gone they've gone for them and they've gone against them in some in some cases. So they, yeah. they, they do need looking at like do absolutely absolutely. And then the other figure that's on that first page here, the feedback report, is what the national average is. So uh, the national average, I actually think it's point, it's 0.99 is what the national average is for dairy uh, the dairy carbon footprint at, at the moment. So there's useful information in that. You have your current carbon footprint. 
you have the change from the previous one, which will allow you to monitor your own progress. And you also have the national average for benchmarking yourself against other farmers of a, of a similar, similar scale. So there's useful information within that. Then on trade page three of the farmer feedback report, you get a breakdown of where those emissions are coming from. And they're, they're broken down into the five, five different headings. So animal digestion, manure. So both of these are animal related. Uh, the fertilizer use, so that accounts for the fertilizer production, the fertilizer type, um, um, the type of fertilizer that you're using and the quantity you're using, um, the feed and, and, and forage production. And then obviously there's other things in here like energy primarily. So uh, refrigerant, um, uh, transport, fuel, any energy, it, basically energy is the main component here. So again, it gives you the three different levels in this. So it gives you your own, um, it's your own breakdown for your own farm. So in this case, this farmer, 40% of his emissions are associated with, with the animal directly with digestion, which is methane. 21% uh, is associated with manure, uh, which again is animal related. Uh, 24 for fertilizer, seven for forage and seven for other. The, the middle bar then relates to where he's, where where that farmer has changed from the previous audit. So in this case, their animal digestion has gone up sl slightly. That could be a numbers change, a number of animals change on the farm. Um, their manure has gone slightly down. That could be because their days of grass are are are, are have increased. Uh, fertilizer use um, has gone down. So or the fertilizer associated emissions has gone down. So it was twenty nine. It's gone down to twenty four. Oh, sorry, that's I've gone the opposite way with that one. Sorry, um, the the forage and feed production was 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 nine was nine and it's gone down to seven, and the energy is more or less the same six and seven. So it, it gives you where you've gone to in in relation uh, across each of these, which will help to make decisions around where you need to focus your energies. But it also gives you the national average. So this last column here, the the the, the middle or that 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 end column. The, where I have the 43% in red, that's giving you where the national average is under each of those. So it, it's useful to see where you are relative to where you are. So the fertilizer has gone down to 24%, the emissions here, the manure has gone slightly up, um, and the animal numbers have gone slightly up as well. And, that, and I'll, I'll, I'll go through each of those in a minute as to what, what, what actions you might take to reduce them. Okay. It's interesting to note, sorry, go ahead, Stuart. Yeah, there's just a question there from Dennis in, um, what's the situation with new entrants? So I presume it doesn't, it, like once they come in as a new entrant, they're, as they're going to be assessed as a dairy herd, obviously, for the first time. So they won't, just won't get the percentage change and they'll be just graded against their, their peers, basically, at the same herd get, type. Yeah, so there'll be no middle line there. They'll have the first line, their own, their, sorry, their own column, and they'll have the national average and they just won't have the other one. And if they still have beef animals there, they're, they're separate anyway. Yeah. You get that separate beef report if you want to, but it doesn't come automatically. But they do calculate the beef component on a dairy farm, but it's just done separately. But yeah, that basically, there'll be no there'll be no progress. It'll be just be a blank for, for that for that. Okay. It's important to note here that 65% of the emissions um, nationally are associated with the animal. So that's actually animal digestion and then the manure as well. So that's storage spreading and uh, at grazing. So and that's that's interesting because when you look at that relative to a beef farm, that's 89% on the beef farm. So on a dairy, far, a dairy farm, 65% of the emissions are associated with the animal, and then the remainder are associated, there's about 16 in, in nationally associated with the fertilizer, but between fertilizer and feed, you have 28% associated. So when we're talking about trying to reduce emissions, we know it's hard enough to reduce methane emissions, and there has to be a big focus in this area in particular around fertilizer, feed, uh, fertilizer and feed. So 65% is animal, and then the remainder, you're looking at 28% associated with, with feed, basically fertilizer use and feed. And then this, there's a, a small percentage, 7% associated with, the, with, the, um, with energy, basically, um, which is quite different from, from the beef side of things. Okay, do you want to go on to the next one? So what I've just done here is kind of taken the, out the five different components and looked at, well, if I'm looking at animal digestion, what does that really mean? What do I need to reduce my emissions in terms of animal digestion or the manure one or the fertilizer use or feed or forage or others? So I, what I've done is just listed some of the main ones that, that you would be looking at. So improving animal product productivity and reducing your carbon footprint is about, it's an efficiency measure, right? Because 
because we're putting on a per kilo uh, fat and protein corrected meat. So improving the productivity of your animals, the efficiency of your animals uh, through breeding, through grasslands, through animal health, um, through all of these things will help to, to, to reduce that figure. Um, improving gen genetic merit. So we know that reducing or improving your EBI by 10 euro, uh, 10 euro will reduce ca carbon emissions by 1% or your carbon footprint by 1%. Improving the quality of grass and, and uh, quality of grass that were grazed and, and the days of grass um, will help to reduce the digestion. We were talking about this earlier on in terms of the, the digestion and reducing methane. Improving your animal health. So if you have more productive, again, it's a down to efficiency and more productive animals that you don't have animals there with underlying health conditions that aren't as productive as they should, should be that will do, dilute down your emissions. And reducing days at slaughter for those of you that have um, a beef component in your, in your herds. Um, the, the longer animals are on a farm, the more methane that they're emitting, um, therefore they're adding to your emissions, whereas if you can reduce the slaughter rate to those animals, um, there's a lot less emissions coming from those. And there's a big push on that on the beef side to try and reduce those days of, as, uh, to slaughter. On the manure side, how do we sort that one out? Um, aim to have most of the 70% of the manures um, spread in, in springtime, so you're trying to get out as much of it as possible in spring to get the maximum value out of it. And I think that's is there, there's three units of a difference, Stuart, between spring and summer in terms of um, the nitrogen availability in, in, in slurry. Yeah, and that's just even on a splash plate basis. So then there's nearly six when you bring in the low emissions into it. Yeah, so the low emissions then, utilising low emissions, you'll have another three units from, 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 using, from using it. Um, and reducing the housing period. So the more slurry... The, more, the longer animals are housed, the more slurry that you have to store. So there's an emissions from the, the slurry storage, but also there's the, the emissions cost in terms of spreading that as well. So that's under the manure one in terms of fertilizer use. The obvious, obvious one is that it's one of our lowest hanging fruit in terms of reducing emissions overall. And we'll see that in the, the, snap, the, the example in a minute. Using protected urea right throughout the year. Um, applying lime. I did mention at the beginning that the first year you apply lime, it is it is a, a source of, of greenhouse gases, but in the longer term, it has significant benefits in terms of reducing our overall chemical requirement, um, chemical N requirement. Identifying P and K requirements to soil sample, and then that's never going to be more important than next than in 2022 with fertilizer prices the way they are, and use of clover. So anything that will reduce the quantity of fertilizer that we use and the and, and changing the type of fertilizer fertilizer will use will help to bring down that carbon footprint figure. In terms of forage and feed, so improving grass utilization in the grazing season, I've already spoke about that, but also reducing constant concentrate feeding. And there's two components to that. One, within the LCA model, the, the, the energy, or sorry, the greenhouse gas cost of producing concentrates, whether that's coming from South America or here, is accounted for. So that's one cost in there. And the other one in is the protein one, which we spoke about earlier on. And then the, the, the final one is around energy, so redu renewable energy sources, so um, solar panels and that, that area, and um, service milking machine to ensure optimum efficiency. So that, that's all about energy efficiency and trying to optimize your efficiency of energy. So those, those details are within the report. So when you look at your report and you look at the breakdown of your greenhouse gases across the various different components of it, there, there are guides around these things within that report that you can look at and try and identify areas that you might concentrate on yourself. Do you want so to move on? Just one good question here again now, Siobhan. Um, I don't think we have the capacity to handle it, but okay. um, Patrick is just asking, regarding digestion and silage, if a farmer has silage, the, the DMD is 78%, so you obviously have a lower NDF percentage, then maybe less cut chewing going yeah. on. Yeah. and lower methane, can, can any allowance be made for that? Like, I, I don't think it is. I, it's not on the sustainability report, as far as I know, Stuart, the quality of the silage. Um, and you see, it would have to be backed up then by with a silage analysis. Silage analysis, analysis exactly, yeah. yeah, yeah because otherwise, it's something worth considering at the same time. Now, but, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and when I come on and I talk about the developments in this, like <clears> more and more Board B are trying to get more accurate information in. So through pasture base true and, and may, maybe down the line there will be a facility in, in pasture base at the moment you can put in you could do your fodder budget but put there may be a capacity there to upload silage analysis in the future that could feed into this because it is a good point if you make exceptionally good silage well the emissions from that are going to be lower than somebody that's feeding 65 dmd silage so it's a good point but it's all in development and and it's something i'll take note of and go back to board view it okay very good 
Okay, so how do you best use the report? I'm not going to spend too long at this because we kind we kind of have uh, spoke a little bit about it already. So making sure that you have an accurate sustainability survey that's that's the first thing because the accuracy of that, especially the first year that you're doing this now and you're going to start taking an interest in it to make sure it's right and follow the same process every time you do an audit, making sure that's accurate. Review where the emissions are coming from. So where are your emissions come from? Um, is fertilizer gone up relative to where it was the last time you did an audit or where you are relative to the national average? And that might help you to pinpoint um, where, where, where changes could be made, where you can concentrate your on energies on in 2022 or beyond. Check your farm's progress and benchmark against other farms. And we all have a little bit of a competitive edge in us, so it's always good to see what other farmers are doing. And it does give you a guide as to where you are relative to others and where you might concentrate your energies to, 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 to reduce your emissions. Put in a, make a plan with your advisor. So I would suggest that you do sit down with your advisor, whoever that is, and identify three or four key areas to help you reduce emissions. Like I gave the list there of some of the main ones under the, the key headings. You're not going to be able to address all of them in the one year. It's about identifying the three or four key ones that will give you the biggest bang for your buck in terms of reducing emissions. Protected urea, we would say, is probably is the biggest one. The and you'll see that. Yeah. It is the biggest one. Um, in 2022, we're going to be faced with fertilizer prices being high. We're going to see a reduction anyway, probably in it, but it's to build that into your plan for the next four or five years. So you're going to be forced into probably reduce the next year. But how do you sustain your, your production, your, your grass production and your animal production in light of doing that and putting the plan in place? And that's, that's cor clover incorporation, soil analysis, building soil fertility, liming, all that type of thing. But rather than trying to do too much, identify a couple of key things. The other point I just want to make on, on, in relation to this, but what's the target? And some people will say, right, we know what the national emissions are on a dairy farm, they're 0.99 per kilo of fat and protein corrected milk, but what's the target? The target at the moment is to reduce this carbon footprint to 0.7 um, kgs of CO2 equivalent per kg of fat and protein protected milk. And I'll come back and talk about a bit, bit about that about like, later on. That's about a 30% reduction, but that's a 30% reduction in the footprint as opposed to a 30% reduction in total emissions. And I'll come back to that, Stuart, later on in the, the presentation. Do you want to move on to the next slide? Okay, so we just deal with one, la one question. I yeah. think this person might have been a, on the dairy conference last week as well. So is there an improvement in footprint if you use slurry bugs is the question. No, I, I would and imagine that the answer is no because it's not being again it's not been able to be picked up of in, in the survey and uh, George has actually responded to that question from the dairy conference and it should be on Chagas daily today so the research that's been done in Chagas so far uh, would suggest that there is no ammonia emissions benefit from any of the slurry additives that are out there the ones that do work are not commercially available because they generally are considered to be quite dangerous products to work with. Yeah, a lot of them are acid-based products that are, should we know that from silage additives in the past, they're not right. that. Yeah, not exactly. That used, so yeah. Um, the, the answer to the question, I suppose, is that it's not being picked up because there's nothing there that's verified that they're doing anything yet. Now, there's a lot of claims being made, but from what work we've done within our own organisation, uh, we haven't seen anything that's suggesting that any of the claims that are being made are actually valid. So, um, yeah, and I just address that. I suppose like we, we we need to have very strong science to be able to add mm. the LCA model, or likewise to the national inventory. So there has to be adequate research to back that up before we can incorporate it into the for the for the for the model to have credibility and for the national inventory to accept it to, to reduce our total emissions nationally. Um, we need plenty of science on it. And I suppose it's just not strong enough there at the moment to be able to. Yeah, do that. I suppose the only thing that we can say is that anecdotally, that the, the, the suggestion is that these seem to be making it easier to agitate tanks and yeah. so forth, and people are finding spreadability benefits to it, maybe. But again, that's a very um, subjective uh, yeah. way of looking at things. So it's hard yeah. to make an analysis on it. So. Yeah, but you would hear people using it for that. So yeah. uh, so where do you start? Just look at this, there's probably a little bit of repetition in this, but so find your carbon footprint, check your progress and sit down with the advisor. Sorry, the, the, the two slides are the same. I just want to point out this, this checklist that we have available to, to clients now through the, the regional offices. And basically it's a checklist of measures to reduce greenhouse gases. Now it would be impossible for you to read it, but it basically goes through the headings that I presented earlier on and looks at your, your breeding policy. It looks at um, your fertilizer use, your soil fertility, 
um, your, your methods of your, your manure management. And basically, it, it gives you a very quick overview of where you're at with all of those things. I think there's 25 questions on it. You mark it out at 25. And then you can see, well, I'm particularly poor on that. Maybe I need to concentrate on, on this particular area or whatever it is. So I would encourage farmers to try and get a hold of that, that checklist, or maybe it's being done with some of the discussion groups at the moment. It's a really good starting point to try and figure out, well, where do I focus my energies in the next short while? So I'll leave it at that one. And I think you said that that's gone out with newsletters this month, is it? Yeah, it's gone out with the signpost newsletter um, this month. Um, it should have been out this week, but there's a bit of a delay on it. Um, but it will go it will go out with the newsletter. So if you're signed up to the newsletter, you will get it anyway. Um, if, and if not, I'd encourage you to sign up to the newsletter because there's some very useful information in it. It's not just for the industry, it's for farmers, it's for everybody. So yeah, that's both of those, that and the beef one will go out this week. Okay. Or in the next couple of next week or so. Okay, it's just to move on. So we have a case study um, done. There's been a couple of case study done by um, Jonathan Hearn down in, in Moore Park, looking at um, ways of reducing carbon footprint. Um, and these 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 case studies are really useful to help us to figure out where are we going to get the most bang for our book in terms of what actions we give us the biggest reduction in in um, in carbon footprint. So this is an example of a dairy farm um, in Cork. So the, just this is the overview of the farm before I go into what kind of actions he was planning on taking. So cow numbers, 180 or 38 cows, um, land base, 82 hectares, stocking rate of 2.48 overall, uh, producing 6,422 kilos of milk, 515 milk solids, um, nitrogen use at the upper end of scale at, at 250, can 70% of it um, going out as can and 30% as urea of the straight nitrogen. No protected urea being used. Um, um, turn out, now this is, this is a scenario, this person is actually using protected urea now, but for the case study previously, they weren't. Turnout date, full time the 17th of March, housing date on the 29th of October. Okay, so that's the overview. The key figures there, his milk solids is 515, so he's, he's, he's doing pretty well already. Stocking rate 2.48. Um, nitrogen use 250 and 70% going out as can and 30% going out as urea. Okay. Sure. Okay, so then what we what, what um, Jonathan did was looked at various different scenarios to see what impact they would have on his carbon footprint. His carbon footprint at the moment is 0.96. So he's a little bit below the national average of 0.99. So the, the, that first baseline there is 0.96, and that's the, the, that's the national, the, he's below the national average as it is. So he's been doing a lot of things very right, very efficient, high levels of efficiency. You can see from his, 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 um, his milk output, but there is scope to reduce that footprint further. And as a signpost farm, he's the target of reducing the footprint to 0.7. So the first thing he did was reduce, looked at um, moving to 100% protected urea. So this is using the LCA model again. This is the same model that Board B used for the, for, the, for the audits. So moving to protected urea, 100% protected urea, reduced the carbon footprint from 0.96 to 0.89. So that's the green bar there. So that reduced it by 0 0.7, 0 0.07, sorry, or 7%. So 0.96 to 0.89. In the second scenario, he's reducing his, his um, chemical N usage by 25%. So there's a whole medley of things in there. Um, it's getting soil fertility right, uh, P's and K's. It's, it's getting the soil pH right. It's um, using clover to, to, to capitalize on, on um, background nitrogen. It's um, putting out slurry, optimizing the value of slurry. So this farmer would have actually analyzed his slurry last to make sure that he was getting full value out of it and we'd strongly be recommending that particularly this year. So it's doing all of the things around trying to reduce nitrogen input, maximizing, putting it out in the right place, the right time, avoiding waste, calibrating slurry spreaders, um, sticking to puffer zones, all of the things that we need to do to reduce nitrogen. In that case, going for reducing nitrogen input by 25%, uh, reduced his carbon footprint to, to 0.91. So reduced it by 0.05, so 5% more or less. So 25% reduction in chemical nitrogen reduced his carbon footprint to 0.91. Um, 150 kilo reduction in, in concentrates. Um, I don't have the concentrate figure for that farm, actually. I'm sorry now. I, I do, sorry. He was feeding nine, 935, actually. So he was feeding 935, so reducing it by 150. 
had the reduction of reducing it marginally. So it went from 0.95 to point, sorry, 0.96 to 0.95. So it only reduced it by 1%. It's relatively small. As I said earlier on, that's related to the production of the forage, or sorry, of the concentrates, but also the protein content in it. In scenario four, he switched into 100% use of LESS, so low emission slurry spreading, uh, benefits in terms of, of emissions, but also significant benefits in terms of an extra three units of nitrogen available um, for a, a, um, to, the, to the to grazing ground. So 0.96 to 0.94, it's reducing it by point uh, by by two percent basically. It's not as high as you might expect expect for greenhouse gases. LESS does reduce greenhouse gases, but it also has a massive impact on reducing ammonia losses. And that's probably the one that we're probably most worried about in terms of the EU at the moment and, and not meeting targets. It is having an impact, but the benefits of it in terms of, as we know, grazing and more nitrogen available are very significant also. The last one there, um, and then the last, sorry, the last scenario is increasing mill solids to 540. So he still had, he was at a very respectable level anyway at 515, but increasing mill solids to 540 took him from a scenario of 0.96 to 0.94. So if you were to look at them, you'd say, Siobhan, look, there's none of them massive. And the reality of it is these two first ones are the biggest ones. So um, the protected urea is by far the one that will give you the biggest reduction in carbon, carbon footprint. Um, reducing the bio, and that, that's over a number of different case studies we would see that. It's the lowest hanging fruit in a lot of ways. Reducing the nitrogen is, now that's a fairly big ask to reduce it by 25%, but over, over with a plan in place, this farmer will achieve that. If we were to put all of these together, so scenario one, two, three, four, five, okay, so doing all of these things, and it's a fair ask to do all of these, but taking the low hanging fruit first, the protected urea and going to that one pretty, pretty quickly will, will go a long way on this. So implementing all of these actions will take the carbon footprint from 0.96 to 0.81. So it's reducing it by 0.15. They're not additive, okay? So just be careful that um, you can't just add up the reductions on each of those to give you the total because they're, they're or sorry, they're not, they're, they're, there's, there's interactions between some of them. So um, you can't simply just add them up. So basically what we're saying here is that these five actions, and these are the, the key five actions, even though there's a good few different actions within the chemical nitrogen reduction, going to protect the urea, reducing chemical nitrogen, reducing meals, LESS, and improving milk solids, will reduce carbon footprint on this farm by 0.15 or, 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 or approximately 15%. And I suppose what's worth pointing out there, Siobhan, then like, is like, this is very doable. Um, straight away and I think also scenario four and while you said that they're not additive you can you could say that within reason you're going to get a six or seven percent reduction straight away by doing those two things alone now there's a bit more planning required in order to achieve that reduction in the fertilizer definitely concentrates can vary from year to year anyway um but like within within reason it's not a big ask to maybe drop that out like I think when you think about it over the course of the main summer grazing season it might only be feeding a kilo less uh, a day possibly in a lot of cases and there's combinations then with that that can impact on grass quality and so forth as well and then the final one there scenario five like again that's that's a factor of what position the farm is in as to whether like i know in this case this farm has gone through expansion and is beginning to mature now so that's yeah. more atta attainable for them but yeah. the real key thing for people to take away from this slide is really that yeah. the easy simple wins are, can be are quite significant which is we're fortunate i suppose in that we can have a big impact with kind of minor enough changes and then we have time to work on the other ones yeah now, if you're looking at what you're going to do next year, people will say, oh, a protected jury is, is shocking expensive. I know all fertilizers are very expensive, but you're going to have to buy some fertilizer. And we do the costings on protected urea versus the ordinary can or, or sorry, the ordinary urea or the can. On a cost per unit of effective nitrogen basis, the protected urea is still coming in cheaper than any of the, uh, than either of the other two. So if you are looking at fertilizers for 2022 and you're looking at protected urea being 50 euro a ton cheap, uh, more expensive than ordinary urea, um, it, it, it is still cheaper um, because of the nitrogen content out of it and the effective nitrogen or the available nitrogen within that. But yeah, that's the easy win. And we've seen that time and again, that going to 100% protected urea will reduce your, 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 your emissions by 7 or 8%, uh, where you're up at that kind of level of, of total nitrogen use anyway. Obviously, on a beef farm, or if, if you're very low nitrogen inputs, 
you're not going to get that. But at that kind of level of nitrogen use, yeah, you will get that kind of a response. And, and they're that kind of low hanging fruit that we need to go after first to kind of try and make that pro that progress um, in the early years. And it's worth pointing out as well, I suppose, Siobhan, like I know that uh, Aidan Lawless now in Johnstown is actually 100% protected urea. And the way he's achieving that basically is if he needs to use PNK, he's using an O1020 product or maybe um, a 16% superphosphate or murate to do his P's and K's elements. Yeah. And he's just using all uh, protected urea then. So yeah. it's but quite just, doable. Like. Just to make a point on that as well, though, there's some very interesting work coming out of Johnstown Castle. Or any of you that are on the, the Signpost News Centre would have seen an update on it last month. They're looking at, looking at the compounds at the moment and they're showing that the compounds, the, the nitrous oxide emissions from the compounds are significantly lower than can as well and, and quite comparable to protected urea. Now, it's, it's early days with it, but the, the compounds are, are, are more favourable um, than what we would have originally thought with them, which is positive. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, just uh, the second last slide, um, Stuart, I just want to point out, and I think it's important to make this distinguish, to distinguish between your carbon footprint and the total emissions, because at the end of the day, we have a requirement under the Climate Action Plan to reduce our total emissions on farms by between 22 and 30 percent. And that's the total emissions from the farm. The total emissions are the footprint multiplied by your total milk output. So it's the footprint. Um, the kgs of CO2 per, k per kg of milk multiplied by the total kgs of milk is what the total emissions are. So you could be reducing your carbon footprint, um, but reducing it alone may not reduce your total emissions. OK, so you, you reduce your carbon footprint, but your total emissions potentially could stay static. They could be increasing, actually, if your milk output is increasing because of higher uh, herd or higher numbers or higher output, um, or they could be decreasing. But it's just to, to, to make that point that when you see that figure of uh, 22 to 30 percent reduction, that relates to total emissions, not to the carbon footprint. Reducing your carbon footprint by 30 percent is a long way along the road, but it's what else you do on the, the other side of that equation, which is on the milk output side of it. And so that's a function of the number of animals by the output. Obviously, improving efficiency will improve your carbon efficiency or your carbon footprint efficiency. Um, but then you have to look at what the total milk output is, which is a function of the number of animals by the milk output. I just want to point that out. There's, there's probably a whole session in that in itself, Stuart, looking at that component of it. But it is important. It would be a risk just to talk, not to just talk about the carbon footprint without highlighting the fact that it's total emissions at the end of the day that we need to, to reduce. So on that, that case study that I presented to you, that was a partial analysis at just looking at the footprint. The next phase of that is to actually look at the total emissions and how does that farmer manage it to reduce his total emissions to meet the, meet the requirements um, while at the same time improving efficiency on the farm and meeting requirements. And the, some of the low-hanging fruit, like your protected urea, the LESS, some of those will help to achieve that, that reduction in total emissions. Okay, <clears throat> and I suppose within individual farms, they can only look at their own situation, but we'll say how all that adds up in total is going to be the significant one. Um, so there will be some farms will be reducing and other farms could still potentially be expanding and increasing as a result of that. But yeah. so it's, and, and you can see that, like we, we, we have seen it, where numbers are maybe held static, but the efficiency of the herd is increasing, so milk output is increasing. But if you get a significantly enough reduction in your carbon footprint, then you will still reduce emissions. But it, it's, it, it's, it's that balance between increasing output potentially increasing and the carbon footprint decreasing. It's the balance of the two of those, mm -hmm. as you can see from the equation. It's getting this equation balanced correctly is... But as I say, that's that's probably a discussion for another day. Yeah. OK, so just the final slide then. So where is where are the future developments going to come with this? There's there's um this is this is an evolving process, the CLCA model. Um, and there will be additions made to it and there will be adjustments over the next couple of years. So in terms of data, we'd like to be able or our board beer would be like to be like to be able to bring in more accurate data, more data that will make that model stronger and make it more accurate and make the, the, the output from it stronger and more useful to yourselves as farmers or whoever is using it. So what you would like to do is develop linkages, say, to pasture base, so you have the grass data and possibly silage data, um, a link into the feed merchants, or sorry, sorry, the, yeah, the feed merchants, so that we have a, like, at the moment, they're taking fairly standard rations. I think you do have to account for soy in the rations, but otherwise it's fairly standard rations you're taking. And now there's more of a move towards Irish-based rations that don't have the footprint associated with 
imported ingredients. So soy, as we all know in South America, there's a huge carbon footprint associated with it. If you're using a ration that's very much Irish based, using a lot of Irish grains and maybe Irish protein sources, well, then the footprint with that is going to be an awful lot lower. So we want to be able to tap into that information to try and make that more accurate. Tap in with the fertilizer, uh, fertilizer merchants in terms of, of, of the, the, the fertilizers that are being used. In terms of the model, um, the model is based, was based originally on a lot of international emission factors. And, and that was fine for its time because we didn't have our own data here in Ireland to, to include in the ELSA model. There was some, but there was a lot of international factors being used as well. And that's fine, but it, it may not suit them. They may not always suit the Irish model or the Irish grass based system. So what we want to try and make sure is that we can optimize the, the number of, of country specific emission factors that were in, are within that model so that it reflects the Irish situation better. And, and all the researchers centers would be working on this around methane, around fertilizer, um, around feed, around all the different areas they're trying to generate these emission factors that are specific to Ireland um, that will make this more accurate. In terms of new research, um, like there's a lot of research going on in methane at the moment down in Moor Park in particular, in, in Moor Park, looking at profiling methane and trying to understand the profile of methane across the year. It was assumed that methane emissions were the same right across the year. Now they're seeing that methane emissions are actually at their lowest at peak milk yield and higher towards the back end of the year. That needs to be accounted for in the model because that will have an impact on, on the emissions figures in there. So there's a lot of research like that coming on stream that will, will change this model. The question that commonly comes up, Stuart, is sequestration, and are we getting? The, are we? Is it being accounted for the 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 carbon being sequestered in our soils and our hedgerows? At the moment, it's not in the model because we need data for it. And I think a lot of people, farmers in particular, are finding that frustrating that we have this this model here, but we don't. We're not getting any credit for the sequestration. There is a serious project going on as part of the signpost program, and um, looking at that and trying to quantify exactly what our soils are sequestering under different management practices, and then what our hedgerows likewise are sequestering. So that will come on stream in the next short while. What we'd like to see is that a farmer would get an annual review of their carbon footprint. So at the moment, you're getting it every 18, year, 18 years, 18 months, which is, not, which is not often enough. You'd like to get that every year, the same as you would get an EBI report or you'd get your, your, your profit monitor. And uh, so Board B are looking into that to try and do that, to feed information in. You wouldn't have an audit every 18 months, but that the updated information could be fed in directly and update the footprint for you. And ultimately, where we want to get to, and I suppose for you and I, Stuart, or for anybody in the industry that's supporting farmers with this, what we'd really like to see is a, a, a decision to support, support tool where you'd have an interface where a farmer or a farmer with an advisor could go in and plug in the details of the farm and do the like the scenario analysis that I that we have done there in the case study. So, right, this is farmer X. His carbon footprint is 1.05 at the moment. Well, if I go to predicted jury 100%, this is what will happen. If I use 100% LE, Yes, this is what will happen. So that's where we're heading for is to have that kind of a decision support tool that will allow you the flexibility to do that. It's a little bit off, but that's that's where this is heading. And I think for, the, for us to get real engagement on that, that's what we actually need. And I would I know I would see that myself on the nutrition side when I was a nutrition specialist. You need that kind of a tool to get that engagement to, to be able to do that kind of analysis. Yeah. Um, Very good. That, we have a we have a decision support tool at the moment. It's called Jonathan Hernan, but we can't roll him out to everybody. Oh, unfortunately, we could, we could do what we want in every region in the country because, uh, yeah, we, it's badly needed. But look, it is coming. Um, it is in the pipeline, but it just will. It's to develop that interface will be will be important. Yeah, very good, Siobhan. That was a super presentation. I'm delighted that you were, uh, were able to come on and give it to us there too, because um, it's just good that probably, like we, as I said, that report has actually been coming to farms which probably four, five, six years maybe, and the level of emphasis that has been put on it, I'd say, is very low. I know in my own case, I probably didn't look at it a whole pile either um, up until more recently. Yeah, so, sure. You don't use it. What chance do we have? <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, to, it's great to get a, a walk through it basically and, and be able to kind of see what what's feeding into it as well and all those and the scenario ca case in a study was good as well so thanks very much for coming on um just uh, we'll wrap it up with that thanks to people for putting in their questions as we we're going along 
back next week. We're going to talk about financials next week. Um, hopefully that won't put people off. Uh, it's been a good year, so it's a good year to be talking about financials, but there's some cost pressures coming next year, so that we need to be aware of those. So thanks for tuning in today. Um, everybody take care. Hopefully Omicron won't uh, catch up with anybody in the meantime when we see you next week. Thanks again, Siobhan.